Hi, I'm Derek Ashong, and you are now in the stream, a social media community with its own daily TV show. We're bringing you stories that are ongoing, global, and sourced from social media. Today, how social media is giving a voice to a lone protester in South Korea and a unique workers' rights caravan in the Philippines. As always, our digital producer, Ahmed Shahab al Din is here looking out for your feedback. Also joining us on the couch today is John Gosier, the co-founder of MetaLayer Inc., a platform for adding context to photos. John, what does that mean to add context? Um, so essentially trying to extract value from a photo without, uh, uh, with minimal human effort. Uh, so we receive photos, uh, we extract the text, uh, we parse that, um, and then we look for uh, relationships in that data. Okay, and how does this, for me as a user, how does this enhance my experience of those images? Sure, so um, you can imagine right now if you want to perform visual search using other tools that are out there, um, you get back information, but it's still a very manual process. You still have to sort of dig through to find what you want. Mm -hmm. Basically, we're trying to, to make that content actionable. So if, it's a, if you're scanning a business card, uh, you've got the email address, you can just email that person right away. Right. Um, if it's a Twitter account, you just tweet that right away. If it's a person, you might find other photos of that person, not based on facial recognition, but mm -hmm. based on other contexts. So it's like you're basically making these images come out more alive. Yeah, we're uh, smart or semantic photos. Okay, I love it. That's really cool. Well, it's great to have you here. I know that you used to work with Ushahidi as well. I want to get a little bit more information about that in sure. the post show, but thanks so much for joining us. Ahmed, speaking of cool things online and making the web come alive, mm -hmm. what kind of things have people been talking to us about? Well, today, uh, Derek, it's no surprise, or should come as no surprise, that everyone's talking about the flotilla, too. So efforts by uh, people and who are... For our, those of our viewers who are not uh, aware of it, explain what flotilla 2 is all right, about. Right, so flotilla 2 is two new renewed efforts, essentially, to send a humanitarian aid, uh, international aid, to Gaza to end the siege, to break the blockade. And we can see right here, using TrendsMap, that this is being discussed in the U.S., in Europe, in Africa, all over, and one tweet that came into us from Hamam Itsu said, I'm sure you'll mention it, but I thought I'd flag it anyway, and as he calls it, it's the inhumane Greek flotilla blockade. Now, Jalal A.K. Jojo, who is a 16-year-old blogger in Jerusalem, uh, who was actually on our show a couple weeks ago, and said... And who I, I actually met there a couple weeks right, ago. Right, when you well. were there, exactly. Yeah. He said, I guess you've already heard that the Tahrir Canadian boat was just boarded by Greek commandos, and it's now heading back to port. Now, this was uh, several hours ago. Um, this is the second attempt. The first attempt was a U.S. ship called the Audacity of Hope, which was returned. And now the second ship, as you can see here, was returned within 15 minutes. So the Canadian boat called Tahrir, which I'm sure you're familiar, is a word which means freedom and comes yeah. from Tahrir Square in Egypt. Um, but then Joseph Dana, who's also been on the show and who was on the Audacity of Hope as a journalist trying to cover the story, basically said to us, it's over. The flotilla, too, has been stopped by the Greek government. So the question is, according to Jalal, Maybe C isn't the approach. Now we're seeing that on July 8th, people are going to try to break the blockade by arriving in Ben Gurion Airport. See right here, Jalal mm -hmm. tweeted us, have you heard of the air flotilla scheduled to arrive at Tel Aviv in the next few weeks to later head to Gaza? Now this is one website where we're going to be tweeting this out where you can uh, follow the story where they're calling on civil society organizations and people of conscience, as you can see right here, around the world to come to Palestine on July 8th for a week of fellowship and peace building. They chose July 8th because in 2004, um, the International Court of Justice from the UN stated that the Israeli West Bank uh, separation barrier was illegal. And so that's why they chose this date. Do you think this is a good uh, approach? Uh, well, I think there's always a place for uh, peaceful protests mm -hmm. uh, and demonstrations, mm -hmm. and I think that that's a powerful statement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this happened a year ago. There was a statement, um, however tragic, tragic it turned out. Right. Um, it was a statement that was heard around the world and actually amplified their message. Well, speaking of amplifying messages, uh, you can have your voice and you can help us put together these stories using the same tools we use. It's called Storify. And it pulls together elements such as videos and photos, as you saw in this story, and audio from across social media. So put together a story for us, and if we like it, we may take it to air. But if you're not familiar with Storify, we've got a quick video right here to help you figure out how you can use the tool. Storify is a narrative tool for the social media age. Log in with your Twitter account. Search what people are saying on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, pretty much anywhere on the web. Then rearrange them any way you like. Add your own explanations and thoughts 
and publish your story for the world to see. Share those stories with us and they and you might just wind up in the stream. Today's viewer suggested story from at LiveJ about Kim Jin Suk, a South Korean woman who's been protesting on top of a 35 meter crane is one that we've mentioned before. The reason we've decided to come back to it is not only because our online community keeps updating us, but also because we managed to speak with Kim Jin Suk. We'll get to what she said in a minute, but first, let's explain what's happened so far. Now, in early January, Kim Jin Suk climbed onto a crane located at the Hanjin Heavy Industries and Construction Shipyard after the company announced initial plans to lay off 400 workers in an attempt to move jobs to cheaper destinations like the Philippines. Kim Jin Suk, a former employee and a member of the company's labor union, joined unionists who'd already been holding a sit-in at the shipyard. Now, I want to take a little bit of an, another image. This is her actually on the top of this crane speaking to workers who are watching uh, from below. Now, I do want to share with you another video that I think is salient and worth uh, considering what's actually happening here on the ground. Violence has broken out on numerous occasions between those who are striking and private security. Although the Hanjin Labor Union did reach a deal with the company last week, about 60 unionized workers have rejected the agreement because the layoffs will remain. Kim has also refused to end her protest, and she remains perched on the crane. We were able to speak with her through someone who contacted us via Twitter. We sent that person questions to ask Kim Jin Suk, who then called her back and recorded her audio on a smartphone. The audio file was sent to us via email, and here, if you'll bear with me, is some of what Kim Jin Suk had to say. I am Kim Jin Suk on crane number 85 at the shipyard of Hanjin Heavy Industry and Construction in Yuangdu, Busan. I'm 52 years old. I've been clinging to this crane for 179 days because the company laid 170 laborers off. The laborers oppose the layoff. I'm here to stop the layoffs. Hanjin Heavy Industry and Construction already carried out a massive layoff of 650 workers in 2003. The company claims that the layoffs were necessary on account of management. However, in 2010 alone, the company gained a surplus of $48 million and made business profits of $65.6 million. Electricity is completely cut off. At night, it is totally dark here. Because the crane is 35 meters high above the ground, there's a possibility of safety accidents. Many people and organizations asked for electricity, but the company still refuses to provide electricity. It seems that the company is afraid that the current situation will be known to the public by Twitter. The company gives me batteries for a non-internet cell phone, but not batteries for a smartphone with which I could do Twitter. They are very strict on it. I want to walk down. I want to meet the people I miss, eat what I want to eat, and go where I want to go. But I can't leave this crane alive until the company withdraws the layoffs. Now, these issues that Kim Jin Suk brings up aren't exclusive to South Korea. Hanjin also operates in the Philippines and is facing even harsher accusations there. Protesters allege that since the company opened their Philippines branch in 2006, there have been 5,000 injuries at the shipyard, including 31 worker deaths. I want to show you some footage that we also found from uh, the Philippines. This is actually came in the form of a slideshow. Now, on Sunday, the Church Labor Conference, an alliance of church congregations and labor organizations, held a caravan for decent work and humane working conditions. Labor groups in the Philippines have described Hanjin as the graveyard for workers' rights, and they're demanding better safety conditions and wages. One of the Philippines Labor Party websites has actually published a press release about Hanjin worker conditions, and in part it reads, Labor groups in the country are getting more incensed with the unabated cases of deaths and accidents at Hanjin, many of them reported and documented, yet largely ignored by the company and government officials. Joining us now via Skype from the Hanjin shipyard in Busan, South Korea, is Sung Mi Park. She's an award-winning South Korean film director who's been taking part in the protest. We also have joining us via Skype from Mandaluyong City in the Philippines, Presi Daguk, the Secretary General for the Maccab Maccabayan Workers 
for people's liberation. She's been involved in organizing the Hanjin workers there. Uh, Sungmi and Preci. Actually, we're going to actually go to the two of them. Right now, I believe we only have audio for, uh, uh, for Preci. So, Preci, can you hear us? <laughs> Okay, how about you, Sungmi? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Sungmi, thank you so much for joining us from South Korea. Tell us a little bit about why you are participating in these protests. I, I just, I am very passionate of uh, her life, Kim Jin. And yeah, her life story touched me very much. And I want to participate. I decide to participate to support her. Okay, I want to ask you to hold there for one second, Sungmi. We're going to take a quick pause to try to get your video up for just a second. But while we're doing that, you know, this is a really intriguing story because yeah. it's one that we've been following now for about a month. Yeah. And we've been consistently getting more uh, feedback from people. And one of the things that I think is really interesting in this instance is it's not simply that the workers are upset that there's strikes. What is being written about this in mm -hmm. Korean press is that because of the lack of a social safety net mm -hmm. in the uh, Korean economy, some people see losing their job as a death sentence. And there have actually been a couple of suicides, a number of suicides of workers, right. one of which happened on that very crane that uh, right. Kim Jin Suk is protesting on. Right. The interesting thing is you said, you know, there's no safety net for society. Ironically, yesterday or the day before, the police actually uh, created a safety net underneath the crane because there's fears after a tweet from Sin Jun Kim that she would either be taken, she'd either come down on her own accord and she would not be forcibly removed. There are fears that she would essentially commit suicide. And I, I believe that's what we were going to just ask. I want to just share before we ask our guests some questions that this story has come in and been reported to us through Storify on multiple occasions. I don't know if you can see my screen. Um, we have tweets. We have tweets and videos that are coming in, um, you know, showing the actual arrests that have been made today. Apparently, 22 people have been arrested. And the story, even though it's been going on for six months, um, is now only starting to really, you know, grow now yeah. that she uh, has been, her phone has been confiscated by authorities. And ironically, the people who are being arrested are people with smartphones, people who can take photos. Yes. People, so I don't know, you could obviously speak to that. Why are they arresting those people as opposed to other protesters? Well, obviously the, the communication is just easier to spread that way. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got multiple ways of sharing photos, photo sharing networks, you've mm -hmm. got Twitter, uh, you've got email on the phones. Uh, I, perhaps another angle to that is the, is the location features of the phone themselves. Right. I don't know how sophisticated the crackdown is, but maybe that's actually become a, a weapon that's well, being used against. It's interesting because we got tweets today saying that when the police came, they actually arrested those with smartphones first. Right. Now I want to go back to our Skype guest, uh, and I'm going to go to Sung Mi first. Sung Mi, we see that you were there we see the crane actually uh, from uh, Hanjin in the background so you're right there on the location I'm curious yeah. talk to us a little bit about the broader labor issue why does this matter so much in South Korea uh, why this issue is so, uh, so much spread in Korea yeah. yes you mean yes uh, because actually she's using the Twitter and I thought uh, the Twitter users was passionate uh, from her Twitter because uh, she's tweeting with joy and humor and uh, there's many fans of um, Kim Jin Suk, I think. And her tweeting touched the people. Now, Sungmi, a quick question. Yeah. You're there at the actual shipyard where just, you know, hours ago, about 20 people were arrested for striking and protesting and supporting her, and I can see the crane behind you. One tweet we have from Galila is saying, the police arrested smartphone users and camera users first. Why, yes. are, why were you not arrested? And, and more importantly, why are you there at 4.30 in the morning? Uh, anyway, uh, for, fortunately, I, when I arrived, they already arrest the people, and uh, one of my friends called me, pay attention, and don't take a picture, and hide smartphone, like this, yeah. Okay, and so me, another question, about the fundamental protest, is the concern that the jobs are being shipped overseas? Why are people so upset about it? Um, what does it mean? Okay, basically, 
is the why are people in Korea so upset about Hanjin getting rid of these jobs? Yeah, because they don't uh, they don't concern about uh, people's life. They don't care about the people. They care only about the money. And so, they, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, Yes, so this um, violence of the capitalism, I think, and every Korean people is touched, uh, uh, touched by her tweet and her life. Very uh, blessed, uh, blessed, blessed life. Now, I want to give some context as well there uh, to what Sungmi just said, right. because part of what's happening is they're saying, yes, they're giving rid of these jobs, but at the same time, in January, they made a payment of, I believe it was 17 billion won yeah. to a small group of protesters. Mm -hmm. The amount that they paid those, I'm, I'm sorry, not a protest, a small group of shareholders, the amount they paid the, for those shareholders is the equivalent is the, of the, sub, the combined income mm -hmm. of our 170 of the workers who refuse to accept the layoffs. Mm -hmm. So the question is, you're giving dividends to shareholders, right. but you're cutting back jobs from uh, the, the workers. And the question is, maybe they're trying to move them to other areas where they can get a better price. And I actually want to bring Pressy into that because of this point. People are saying in Korea that the jobs are being sent to Philippines because they can get more efficient workers for cheaper. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, why are people in the Philippines also protesting? Are you not happy to be say, having those jobs? Uh, uh, first, of course, given the large number of unemployed in the Philippines, we Filipinos are glad that a, ship, a shipbuilding company based in South Korea came in the Philippines to employ 21,000 workers. Go but on. Uh, at the same time, we as workers who feel the same way as the workers in South Korea who are being deprived of their right to security of tenure are unhappy because we are both affected by the same company that represses the workers' rights. We, the workers here in the Philippines, that is based in Subic, Sambales, the Hanjin workers in Subic, Sambales, are being deprived of our basic labor rights, such as having safety inside the shipyard. Now, in that point of safety within the shipyard, we're hearing reports that a, a significant number of deaths have happened and many, many more injuries have happened since the shipyard opened in 2006. Why has the yes. Philippine government not held Hanjin responsible? That is what uh, our hearts are aching for at this moment because there has been several um, attempts by the government to show us that it has the political will to address the four-year ongoing problem of the workers in the Hanjin shipyard in Subic through a Senate Labor Committee hearing that was an investigation that was held uh, on February 2009. But the Senate Labor Committee head, Chairman Senator Jingoy Estrada, only issued several recommendations that are based on what the law is talking about occupational health and safety implementation inside the shipyard, such as uh, creating a 300-bed hospital facility in order to ensure that the workers who suffer from grave accidents inside the shipyard will be treated immediately. Okay, uh, uh, now I want to interrupt you there, Apresi, for just one quick second. I want to get your thoughts on this, John, because it seems like you've got a situation that's been going on for a long time in uh, both Korea and in the Philippines. Yeah. Now you've got these protests rising in both areas, Solitary. but it's not getting a lot of international media coverage. What role do you think that social media can play in getting the word out about stories like this? Well, it's interesting. I think that um, the discovery of stories like this doesn't always come through uh, the obvious sources, the mainstream media. Um, uh, Twitter uh, obviously plays a huge role in just these these types of movements finding out about each other, and yeah. then they be, sort of bubble up and become a bigger story, and then everyone's wondering, 
you know, how that happens. Just to expand on that, I mean, the answer is in the fact that we're able to report this story with these two people right now. You know, yeah. we've had people send us several storifies, including a Korean actress who's very famous who got involved in the story earlier in June. Now, I hope we can just play this thought. I, we have a recorded uh, soundbite from her, even though she was so scared to actually appear on the show, she sent us this in. Let's see if we can hear this. Okay, it seems that we're not going to be able to show this because we're having some technical difficulties. But basically, I want to ask Sung Mi, um, you found out about this story from a Korean actress who brought a lot of attention nationally to this story. Why was she and many others who have helped us tell this story scared to appear on the show? And why, why do you think that, are they scared of the government coming after them? What are they afraid of? Uh, it's just for Kim Yo Jin, the actress. Uh, because every time she tells something on the media, uh, actually the Korean media is used to focus on Kim Yo Jin, like Kim Jin Suk. So she wants the media focused on Kim Jin Suk. And the whole attention. And yeah. if we focus on Kim Jin Suk, you've spoken to her yes. recently. What has she told you in your last conversation with her? Uh, when has. Uh, what, what has Kim Jun Suk told you the last time you spoke to her? Uh, she was worried about me. How are you? How cold are you? Right like this. Mm -hmm. How cold are you, even well, though she's been there for six uh, months? Yeah. Yes. Well, the one point that's also worth bringing up is that the actress has actually apparently been summoned to by the police yeah. uh, to testify about what's going on. Presi, I want to come back to you again on this similar topic. Um, we understand that in uh, the Philippines, Hanjin industry is working through a network of about 19 different contractors through whom they hire all their employees. So are they, how can you hold them to any kind of criminal liability if they're actually operating through sub-companies? There is a liability, the company has a liability, uh, what the Philippine Labor Code says. What they are doing now, employing these several subcontractors in order to uh, make the employee employer relationship nebulous to avoid a union in the Philippines for the workers in Hanjin is against what the labor code is sta sta stating. Like it is job only contracting, and labor only contracting is illegal because, according to the law, if your business is shipbuilding and the workers are performing jobs that are part of creating a ship that is supposed to be a regular work uh, employed by Hanjin. No, no subcontractor can, can uh, work in between that. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, with the growing accidents at the shipyard, with the growing death and the growing number of maltreated Filipino workers by the Korean superiors, we are thinking of filing a class suit if they will not address this problem immediately. So, uh, John, I think part of what might be happening here is maybe the Korean government or the Philippine government isn't getting involved because there's so much money at stake. Hanjin is a very big company. Yeah, I think there's, uh, I mean, there's definitely an interesting thing going on, not just here, but around the world of sort of like grassroots movements uh, uh, protesting corporations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for uh, throughout history, right. it used to be the state that we're so afraid of, but now the corporation has sort of like become a second entity that uh, many people are worried about. Well, and on that point, we actually see this tweet on Ahmed's screen from Emun824. It says the Korean government has to walk up and stand behind the people, not the big corporations, moving jobs away from people. It will cause suffering in Korea. Now, we must note that we did repeatedly contact representatives of Hanjin Heavy Industries for an interview. We were told they would get back to us, but we have not heard from them so far. Sung Mi and Presi, I want to thank you both for joining us in the stream. It's been a pleasure. John, great having you here. We're going to be continuing our stream stream.aljazeera.com discussing a little bit more about this issue as well as some other key issues that have come to us continue conversating with us using the hashtag AJStream we will see you online